Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have the pleasure of having Julie Hansen with us. Julie is a global executive advisor and is a divergent thinker fueled by intense curiosity. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> and she has a drive to guide companies to be better. So she and I've had this pre-conversation and just loving all the things that she's sharing, but really at the heart of it, it's about, you know, how does she help companies become more purposeful? She helps them to understand the new definition of long-term success and where there are opportunities to transform through a combination of their values, vision, people, and technology. She is an adventurer, a philanthropist, and she travels across continents engaging and giving back to people, organizations, and our planet. She finds it fuels the creativity, perspective, and critical thinking she uses every day as an advisor and an executive leader. Julie coined the term that never underestimate the power of human connection, which is so incredible and which is also why we're here today. So Julie, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, Vicki. Thank you for having me. So excited talking with you today. Well, it's our pleasure. So Julie, let's just jump right into questions because I have many and, and you know, even in our pre-discussions, we, we've talked about so many different things, but you are an adventurer and you've been a road warrior. You've traveled all over the world and had this global impact. So what would you say are some of the most common threads, uh, especially amongst women globally? Yeah, a little background on why I'm an adventurer and why I travel the world. Um, part of it has to do with work, but part of it has to do with my, my own interest in understanding people in the world better. And um, when I've been to different places, I've been doing a lot of volunteer work or a lot of mentoring work along with advisory work in my, in my role at Salesforce. And some of the most interesting conversations that I've had have to do with um, people reaching out for advice on how to move forward in their career and how to be better. And um, one of the most interesting things I've noticed is that it's very common for people to have the same question and the same concerns around the world. And um, one of the themes that I've noticed in talking with people is, is that they lack confidence. And even though you can't tell from the surface as far as what you see in front of somebody, I noticed that we all share something that I call imposter syndrome and you hear about it in different ways um, through different references, but it's also not talked about a lot. And so one of the things that I found most interesting is to bring that to the forefront and to talk about it and to realize that we are all human and we're all trying to be better and to find our way. And so we can often feel that we're not good enough and that we don't have what it takes and what you project on the outside versus what's actually going on, um, there can be a lot of turmoil with people in terms of what that looks like. Yeah, wow, that is, yes, you're absolutely right. And hear that often, right? Because, and we put on a good face, right? But it's really what is happening on the inside because uh, we tell ourselves a lot of stories, which is unfortunate, yeah. And so what are, sorry, oh, I think that people should know that. Um, when I was over visiting Harvard, for example, and talking with PhD students over there, it was a prevalent piece of conversation because there's an expectation that's set that if you're going to be going through to do a PhD, that you're smart enough, capable enough, and you don't need help. And as we know in the world, that's not normal compared to the rest of our lives. It's important to be around people to ask for help to, to uh, bring skills and knowledge together and um and that's what makes the creativity for innovation things that we do and so that's just one example of where it can be really limiting as a belief to to hold that yeah yeah absolutely you're so right and and we don't move forward when that happens when we get so caught up in the stories we forget about you know what we are actually capable of and what that real power is inside us and you said that beautifully so what might be some of the differences, Julie, that you've seen globally and that you've actually adapted into your own life? Some of the differences globally are definitely cultural. Um, and that can be a conversation you can have forever. Because when you think about how broad the, you know, the world is and all the people in it, and culture means so many different things. It can mean anything from the country that you're born in to how you were raised 
to all the different messages and influences that you've had along the way. You know, people change countries, they don't stay in the same place. Um, they have different experiences in terms of what family actually means to them. And all that shapes the individual. And the interesting thing as humans is we don't necessarily see that. You know, we talk about being more self-actualized and that's a skill you have to develop. But a lot of it is subconscious and it drives what we choose to do, what kind of career we go into, a lot of that. And so I think that that's what makes everybody unique, but it's also something that people um, as individuals uh, should take a look at. And so sometimes when you're seeing certain behavior patterns or belief systems that are prominent in a certain area, um, it can be related to a, a larger influence of culture. One example is um, when I was in India, some of the women that I was speaking with um, were very torn between wanting to be more assertive and being taught that they had to be nice and polite and kind. And so they struggle between the two because there's a belief that they had to be different to get ahead. And so they were struggling with the conflict of how they were raised. Wow. Yeah. And so you've spent a lot of time in different parts of the world mentoring and helping women. So what are, what are some of the things that, you know, you try to implement or try to help them see so that they can, you know, live purposefully in the way they want to live? My own belief is uh, to always be curious, right? And that's me. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be that way, but being curious to me is a more open way of addressing fear. And I think a lot of people will, will tell somebody to say, you know, do something that, that scares you every day. Like it, it's a muscle that you have to build. And then you're thinking like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what's that fearful thing like that is the right step to do every day? Because it's a certain mindset. Um, I look at it more as why don't you be curious about something every day and take a step and ask a question or just do something different or go to a different place, read a different type of book, um, jump outside of what you would normally do, just walk a different park. Um, and I think those are the little things that make you appreciate the differences and then that all starts to collect. And so you're like, well, maybe I'll do this other thing or maybe I'll try a book here or maybe I'll say hi to that person in line this time where I didn't before. And so I think it leads to an openness, which to, I believe is the opposite of fear. So it's getting there a different way. I love that. And so when talking about fear, so earlier when we were talking, you were sharing with me how to turn fun, like make it fun versus fearful. So you should just share that example of when you were doing that speaking engagement, because that, that blew me away. <laughs> so, um, a number of years ago at Salesforce, I, um, we had our global conference and I was curious about doing, I wanted to do something different and I wanted to see the conference from a different lens. And so I was spending a lot of time with customers up front, uh, lots of meetings and things like that. And I happened to approach uh, a mentor of mine and, and asked if I could help him with something. And he turned around and he, and he was speaking on stage and he said to me, he said, I need a guest wrangler. And I said, what is a guest wrangler? And he said, well, we're so busy this year that the, um, the production crew doesn't have someone to help me cue people, get them ready on and cue them on stage for the pre-show, which happens before the big keynote. And so this all came from, uh, originated from when we started to stream live the conference. And so if you're sitting here at home on Zoom watching it, you don't want to watch people fill a room with seats. And so they wanted to make an informal show that was interesting to listen to while everyone was collecting in the auditorium. And so I became a stagehand. So, you know, by day at that time, I was doing engineering work and working a lot with customers um, from a solution and a transformation perspective. And then I'm running around in black as a stagehand around the stage. And, uh, it was really a good experience for me because I grew up around stages and, um, and around the arts. And so I was just curious to see what it was like in a bigger setting. And that's the only reason that that happened. But what came of that is he asked me if I wanted to be on stage with him the next year. And I was so surprised and just went, 
oh my gosh. And then I thought, I just said, yes. And I thought, I'm not going to worry about what that means. What that actually does mean is that I would be in front of 20,000 people in a room with it streamed to somewhere between three and 10 million people all live. And, um, and so when that happened the next year, I didn't ever think that it wouldn't happen. And so somewhere I just knew that the best thing to do was to only focus on the fun of what it's going to be like to really engage, to make sure the person I was interviewing was relaxed and having fun with me on stage and to not worry about all the other people in the room, because I knew that they would be staring at us and be, you know, you just, you, you know that you are the center of attention and that's not what you want to have going on there. And so it made it really easy. And I didn't think about it from a fearful perspective. I thought about it from a preparation perspective and then making sure my guest was super comfortable and that that person was prepared. And then just to have fun with the dialogue and to just be in our own little bubble up there on the stage. And that's what made it work. And so often I get asked, how can you possibly stand up in front of people in, in those types of volumes of, of attendees? And I just said, I just focus on having a great time with it and to be my best. Good for you. That's so awesome. I love that. And because there's a couple of things that you said there that were, you know, so important, especially for women, because we don't say yes to enough. And so you didn't even think about it. You were just like, yes, I'm going to do this. And you didn't worry about what the numbers were because really that was irrelevant. Right. But then you took that fear and put it in its place and, and made it a fun situation. And when you can, you know, sort of get out of our own heads and, and start to look at it that way, that then it is fun, right? Because it's like, who cares? And my daughter just last March, just prior to COVID, uh, she was asked to stand up and speak at a WIT conference, Women in uh, IT, or yeah, Women in Technology Network. And she was terrified because she's only, she was 14 at the time, right? And there's like 400, 440 people in the audience and it was live streamed. And that's exactly what she did. She, she was with Cheryl Stoops from uh, SHI and they did an improv skit. And I said to her, just pretend like nobody's there. Like it's just you and Cheryl. And she got so many compliments after, but what it did is it builds the confidence, right? Because then you go, well, if I can do that, I can do whatever, right? But it takes a lot of grit and courage, really, to get up there and be able to do that. So I love how you've shared, just say yes, just do it. You'll yes. figure out the how. <laughs> you know, I think about, I'm a woman in tech, and when I think about WIT, the W-I-T initials, I think, you know, that really should stand for with tenacity. Oh, because yes. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's what really drives us to be better. And it is grit and it is courage and it is fun. And when you talk to, you know, other people in performance, like athletes or um, um, people in the arts, they don't focus on the fear either. They focus on truly giving and, and being in a place where they're being their best. And when you are an athlete, like a figure skater, you know, you are definitely thinking through your craft not worrying about your audience, except for the fact that you want to really make that audience enjoy the performance, right? So it's all about the skill and the choreography of what you're doing. Yes, that's so well said. And you know, what I find, Julie, is a lot of times we get focused on the judgment. We're worried about, you know, how are people gonna perceive us? And, you know, it's, it's trying to remove some of that, right? That, because that's what drives the fear, is that we're, we're concerned, will we get embarrassed? Will we fail? Failing is how we learn, right? Like that's all part of the experience, but it's not being so focused on that as much as what you just said, creating that environment of enjoyment and, you know, just trying to make somebody's day. And even if it's one person in the audience, you've done a good thing, right? So I, I enjoy that. And one of the tips like um, for preparation is to put your, you in a place where you don't have to worry about some of the things. So, so candid example, you're standing on stage, what are you wearing? You know that people are gonna be looking at you, raking you up and down. And so you wanna wear what you feel comfortable in. That's not the time to wear something that you're, you've never worn before or that you're not sure of, because that takes one thing off the menu that you have to be concerned about is, what if I have a you know, wardrobe malfunction or something like that? And the other thing would be your preparation. 
right? So, and this is very common for anything that you go into when you have that preparation ahead of time, then you can allow for the delivery to flow because you've practiced, you've done your homework. And, and that's a pretty common thing across, you know, all parts of your business and career is to make sure that you are um, in a place where you can contribute the best way possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love how you said that and not worry so much about what you say. It's how you say it, right? Cause nobody else knows what you're going to say. Yeah. So, and we get so caught up on that. That's what I kept trying to teach my daughter. It's like, it doesn't matter because nobody knows what the actual skit is about or what the actual conversation is about. Just go with it and you'll be fine. And I you think know, there's something I want to say there um, is um, in thinking about my, my niece, like how you, you're, you're referring to your daughter and how they're trying to figure their way along and they're, they're younger. And one of the things that I wish I had done sooner when I was, was young, and I think now there's just more resources as well, is to, to know that it's a really good thing to have many different types of, of coaches and counselors in your life. And that that's not a weakness, that is an absolute set of tools. Yeah. And, um, you know, because I'm seeing uh, young people struggling right now with COVID and, and their stresses, and they worry what people think to go out and get that kind of help, um, to help them with their mental state, just in terms of mental health, not even performance. Um, you have to, people need to know that that's an absolute strength to do that. You can't go things alone. And there are people out there trained in so many things, you should take advantage of that. And, um, and I was telling you, when I uh, spent time interviewing Tessa Virtue, the amount of different coaches that she's had over time um, has been key to her ability to be an Olympic athlete. Um, and some of them were psychologists because you're working around the stress of competition, uh, the stress of having imposter syndrome, the stress of um, having doubt yeah. and um, working, communicating with someone every day. And, and it's reassuring to the rest of us to see that this is something common that happens in so many different types of careers, that it's not just for high performance folks, it's for all of us to know that there's tools and people out there that can help you with one question or that can be with you for a long time to help you develop and, and just be better. Yeah. And that's in your life, not in just your career. Yeah, absolutely. Hundred, yes, 100%. Totally agree. And even for myself, like, you know, I'm a coach, but I have a coach because you do, you want to constantly be, you know, how do you evolve as, as a person and, and not just your career, it's all aspects of your life because we are a whole being. We're many facets to our, to our world, right? Yeah. And another thing that I think is an opposite word to fear is the vulnerability. And I know it's becoming much more popular in recent years because of Brene Brown. And when I first heard of her, it was, it was probably 2011. And now she's so much more prominent as, as a figure. But, you know, think about that. That's another thing that we've just never talked about. And, and again, we, it's probably the best skill that you can develop is the ability to know it's okay to be vulnerable. And that's the human element of what actually draws people together. It's not the fact that you can stand up on stage and deliver and look completely poised. It's actually the fact like with your daughter that you can do a skit and you can be yourself and show that you, you're, you, know, you have flaws as a human. And that's way more reassuring to people to know that they can be okay. Because we have inner voices that can really drive us in hard ways. You know, I'm hard on myself. I know lots of women who are hard on themselves. Men are just as hard on themselves. And so how do you work with that if you uh, feel you have to be caged up and keep it all hidden? Yeah. You don't, right? And so that's where you, you know, connecting to other people and to be okay to know that you're not perfect is what, allows you to build the connections and allows you to learn and expand faster. Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. And you're also giving them permission to do the same, which is, which is a gift, right? Because when you can show up authentically as to who and how you are, you know, then you're showing other people that that's what you want them to do. So it doesn't have to be this 
facade that happens to your point, just pretending like everything's okay. Um, yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. And so I know we're getting close to our time, but one thing I really would like to tap into, um, you and I had this great conversation about the V2 mom and how that has impacted you personally as well as professionally. And I thought that'd be a great uh, way for us to kind of wrap up today. If you want to share what that means exactly. Yes. So the V2 mom is a tool that we use at Salesforce. And it stands for vision, values, so those are the two Vs, methods, obstacles, and metrics. And it originated uh, via Mark Benioff, the founder, when he started the company, he wrote down his goals for that year. And being a startup, one year was as far ahead as you looked, you know? And then every year he would recreate the V2 mom again with his founders and with his leadership team. And that built out to what we have today is a V2 mom structure that every single employee in the company writes. So we're all aligned and we can see everyone's. And so it's very transparent. It helps you set your goals um, as far as how you're going to um, perform within the company for the year and how we reach goals that we're constantly innovative. But it also created, it's such a simple structure that a lot of people in the company started to use it for their own personal growth. And so it got a nickname of the Me Too Mom. So people would write Me Too Moms, which was it's the same structure, but it's for your own self and your own life. And I've used this when I've mentored different people and it's allowed them to think differently. I, I write my own, but do you actually know your personal values because they should guide you? And do you know what your vision is as a person? Like, where do you wanna be in life? And can you write that down? And then how do you get there? So the methods, Obstacles and metrics, it's very much like any other planning tool. You put them in order, but then you're setting up a series of steps for how to reach some of those things. And time and time again, you'll see that that just thinking through some of the elements of where you want to go and who are you as a person and what draws you to certain things. Like the fact that I'm an adventurer, you might not be an adventurer. The fact that I'm curious and I'm a constant learner, that's not to say everybody is, but because I know that those are my strengths and I apply them into a structure like the Me Too Mom, it allows me to go in the direction that I want that resonates with me. Because I think a lot of people can get caught up in the career part, and you see this all the time, Vicki, where they're going to be like, I should do this, or my next step in the ladder is this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need to challenge them and say like, why is that? Like, do you know where you want to go? And like, what ultimately do you want to do or with or be in your life? And is that the, the trajectory, trajectory you want to be on? Um, and so knowing yourself, and it's not like a one shot deal, but being insightful and be able to put a plan in place that allows you to move forward, but to check it every year, just like we do at Salesforce, we rewrite these things. We rewrote them with COVID as well, because the world changed. Um, it's a living document that's more of a strategy to guide you than an absolute step-by-step -step plan. But it allows you to take you know, some of the um, other points that we talked about in this interview in terms of who you are and some of the struggles we have and imposter syndrome you know, and being curious versus being fearful, but putting them into a sort of a set of steps that allows you to take those steps so that you're moving forward and then you can see the, the progress you're making um, and how that's making you thrive. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And thank you for sharing that because that comes up often when, you know, you have conversations with people, it doesn't matter whether it's male or female. And I remember one woman said to me, this was like last year we were at, and I've said, so, you know, let's talk about, you know, what is your vision? And she looked at me and she got really quiet and she didn't say anything. And I was like, just giving her space. Right. And she finally, she looked at me, she goes, I can't even believe I'm going to say this to you. She said, but I've never thought about it. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, don't feel bad about that because sh it shouldn't shock you. A lot of people don't take time because we fall into careers sometimes or we fall into patterns and we don't step back. So I love the fact that you do this every year. And I love that you're, when you're mentoring women from all over the world, you know, that you're using this format because it is simple, but it really connects to the core of who you are. Right. And, 
it, it, it encompasses so many different aspects of our life. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. I think if you don't have that, you can run the risk of waking up later in life. You know, there's that cliche where you look back on your life and you feel like you were on a train you couldn't get off. Yeah. And so being more purposeful as far as who you are and how you want to show up in the world. And that's like, that comes down to things like, you know, I want to be a mom. I want three kids. Yeah, I want to give back and volunteer. I want to travel to Indonesia. Like all those types of things can go into that. Um, but then you have steps to, to reach it. And um, um, I really think it, if possible, you should live without regret. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Yes. And you and I talked a little bit about this even before we, you know, got on the podcast about it, right now people are so fearful with COVID and we can't stop living. We, we have to keep living and we don't want to have a regret in a year from now. And there's so many positive things that are happening and we have an opportunity to actually change the world as we've known it. Right. And even people working from home, you're getting more family time, you're getting more me time. Like all, there's so many great things that happen and we don't want to wake up, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now and say, oh, I wish I had like, just say yes, just do it. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and, you know, personally, I've spent some of the time being home, um, just changing some of my lifestyle in terms of being healthier, in terms of having a better practice. I mentioned to you, like I do daily yoga um, but I've also, you know, completed courses. Like uh, one of the things I think that's essential is to always be learning and also learn to unlearn certain things that don't serve you anymore. And, um, and so, and I'm not saying everyone has the time, time to do this because everyone's lives are quite different right now. But for me personally, I thought, you know, I have some time. What do I want to do at that time? And for me, I wanted to learn and focus on some some different things that have been on the like, lower on the VT mom list. And so it's been good for me to, to, to fit that in. Beautiful. Julie, I can't thank you enough. This has been fabulous. So inspiring and just, you know, really am grateful that you shared all of the wonderful things that you're doing globally and right here at home. Um, it's been a pleasure having you join us today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having Vicki. I've enjoyed talking with you as well. Thank you.